So how is everybody doing this afternoon? So um, this talk is kind of, uh, you know, to get us away from the news that we're hearing about every day and, you know, <laughs> just something different that we don't hear about constantly. We're going to look at presidential scandals, um, but we're going to look at older presidential scandals. We're leaving the 21st century away, uh, behind. I don't know how, how I want to phrase that, but we're not looking at the current uh, political situation in the United States. We are going to stop our discussion of scandals in the late 20th century, but that still gives us plenty of uh, fodder, plenty of, of stories to tell. So, uh, short of glory, a brief history of presidential scandals. Can everybody see this okay? Okay. Can you get that one? All right, there you, thank you. Yep. So, where do we begin? in our discussion of presidential scandals. Uh, who was the first president? Washington. Washington. Do we have any scandals with Washington? Yeah. Well, yeah, but chopping down this cherry tree, which never happened. Um, but we're, we're going to ignore Washington. We're going to ignore Adams for now. So we're leaving the 18th century out of the picture also. And we're going to begin with president number three, Jefferson. Jefferson. Now, why would we begin a story of presidential scandals by looking at Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> Sally Hemings. Sally Hemings. Um, this is a contemporary cartoon uh, of Thomas Jefferson, the philosophic cock. Uh, perhaps there's a double entendre there. Um, but what is the cartoon depicting? What are we talking about in this image? Well, there was Thomas Jefferson, the philosopher, the great thinker, the author of the Declaration of Independence, and his um, kind of not really secret secret of his relationship with Sally Hemings. Now, who was Sally Hemings? It was a slave. It was actually his wife's slave. Um, and strangely enough, was also his wife's half-sister. Oh, um, yeah, so uh, Martha Jefferson uh, came from a long line of established Virginia slaveholders, and her father fathered a daughter uh, by one of his slaves. That slave was Sally Hemings, who comes into the service of Thomas Jefferson, and um, in that intimate relationship, they end up with this. Now, Jefferson uh, never publicly acknowledges this relationship, but there are rumors swirling around him. Uh, Sally Hemings accompanies him when he goes to France as the American ambassador. She is with him uh, pretty much constantly at Monticello when he is uh, off on his diplomatic duties. So this rumor, and here we see uh, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings there in the background, circulates. It becomes a dirty little secret of Thomas Jefferson and his administration. Um, is there truth to the rumor? Well, yeah, it, yeah, it depends who you ask. Uh, for a long time, Jefferson's de descendants said, no, that, that was, it's a rumor, it's political uh, rumor, there was no truth to it. Uh, Sally Hemings' des descendants, however, said, of course it's true. Look at the situation. There was even uh, in the early 2000s, I believe, um, DNA testing that was done. And sure enough, Sally Hemings' descendants have some DNA that matches the Jeffersons. But was it Thomas Jefferson? There are still some who claim it wasn't Thomas, but his brother, who was the guilty party in all of this. In any case, we start with Thomas Jefferson, uh, president number three, author of the Declaration of Independence, author of the Virginia um, Bill of Rights, uh, fr religious freedom, founder of the University of Virginia, and one of our first big presidential scandals. We jump from Jefferson, uh, we'll move forward a couple of decades, to Andrew Jackson. Oh. <laughs> uh, and that's a, an appropriate response for Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson is one of the most um, divisive presidents in American history, really controversial uh, today. Why? Well, the Trail of Tears, the entire idea of Indian removal, and many of his economic policies had a detrimental impact on 
the growth of the United States. His war with the Second Bank of the United States, his, um, his attempts at levying um, tariffs and that sort of thing really do begin to impact the American economy. And in fact, the year after he leaves office, the economy tanks and you have the panic of 1837. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, what are the scandals that are attached to Andrew Jackson? Mm -hmm. Well, there's one scandal that um, deals with Jackson and his wife. Andrew Jackson's wife is named Rachel, Rachel Robards Donaldson Jackson. And what is the scandal with Rachel Jackson? Well, Andrew Jackson lived out on the frontier. He was a frontiersman out in the wilderness, Kentucky and Tennessee. That is where he kind of grew up, where he made his name. And Rachel Robards Donaldson was a frontier woman who had lived out in the wilderness. Um, as sometimes happened in relationships in the wilderness, Rachel was married, but her husband disappeared. He went out into the woods one day and never came back. Never comes back. Around that same time, who comes along but a young, strapping Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson and Rachel Robards Donaldson fall in love. And sure enough, they get married. Everybody assumes husband number one is, is dead. dead. Well, but, but guess what? <laughs> guess who wasn't dead? And guess who shows up? Husband number one. Now we have a problem, right? What's the problem? That Rachel Robards Donaldson Jackson is married to two men at the same time. She is a bigamist. Is that illegal at that time? It is illegal at that time. Now, this is a situation. How do we solve this situation? Luckily, Andrew Jackson had some pull. He had some clout in the frontier. And he manages to arrange a quickie divorce from husband number one and, and a legal remarriage to Rachel. So everything seems good. Everything is fine. They've cleaned up that situation. And uh, everybody forgets about this. Until the election of 1828. The election of 1828 is widely considered to be one of the dirtiest presidential elections in American history. Now let that sink in for a second. <laughs> um, it was one of the fiercest, most hard-fought, nastiest campaigns. The election of 1828 saw the sitting president, John Quincy Adams, um, facing the challenge of Andrew Jackson. Now why was this election so fierce? We have to backtrack four years to the election of 1824. In 1824, four men were running for the presidency. Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, uh, William Crawford, and Henry Clay. When the American people went to vote for president in November of 1824, Andrew Jackson had the most popular votes. He had the most electoral votes, but he did not have a majority. He did not have more than 50% of the electoral college. That meant that nobody was elected president. Nobody won the campaign. Nobody won the election. So how are we going to decide who's going to be president? House of Representatives. House of Representatives. By the terms of the 12th Amendment, which was added to the Constitution in 1804, uh, that has to do with Jefferson's, Jefferson's administration and Aaron Burr. But that's another topic altogether. Uh, by the 12th Amendment, the House of Representatives would choose from among the top three vote getters. So you had four candidates, but only three of them can be chosen or can be decided among by the, the House. The top three vote getters were Jackson, Adams, and William Crawford. William Crawford was Secretary of War, Secretary of, of something else at the time. Um, that meant Henry Clay, who finished in fourth place, was out of the picture for being chosen president. But what was Henry Clay's position? What was his job? He was the Speaker of the House of Representatives. He was the leader of the body that was going to choose the next president. So he couldn't be the king, but he was certainly the king maker. Now, what does this mean? It means that the House of Representatives is all in a tizzy. We have to choose the president. And there are debates that are going on and arguments that are being, that are being uh, fought out. As the Constitution, as the 12th Amendment is written, each state got one vote. So all of the representatives from one state had to decide in unison who they were going to cast their vote for. 
And while this debate is going on, this furious debate in the House of Representatives, John Quincy Adams, who was the sitting Secretary of State, has a meeting with Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House. Behind closed doors, they sit and they chat for a couple of hours. At the end of this meeting, Henry Clay comes out, goes to the House of Representatives, and begins rallying support behind Adams. When the House finally decides to vote to choose the president, who ends up winning? John Quincy Adams. He's chosen to be our sixth president. Andrew Jackson's kind of okay with that at first. Well, you know, the system, that's how the Constitution is written. We'll get him next time. But what does uh, Adams do? Almost immediately after winning the presidency, he turns around and appoints Henry Clay to be his Secretary of State. In the early 19th century, the Secretary of State was the stepping stone to the presidency. If you're a Secretary of State, you're basically next in line for the, for the, the head office. So Jackson and Jackson's supporters say, aha, there was a corrupt bargain. Henry Clay sold his soul, sold his vote for the Secretary of State position for that next step to the presidency. And right from that moment, Jackson and his supporters are fervently working against John Quincy Adams. Anything Adams tries to do in his four years as president is essentially blocked by the Jacksonians who have a majority in Congress. Adams has one of the least successful presidencies in uh, American history in terms of getting things accomplished. He had all of these plans. He, he was very far uh, forward looking in his plans, but he couldn't get anything through Congress because of the political animosity. Yet in 1828, Adams runs for re-election and Jackson is his opponent. So we have this, this thing with Rachel in the background into that political setting. The election of 1828, as I said, was brutally fought. Uh, both sides were hurling insults at one another. Now, elections in that days, you didn't have the candidates out actually campaigning, but they had their, their proxy, their, their supporters, you know, writing newspaper articles and, and uh, crashing uh, ga political gatherings and that sort of thing. It was very rough and tumble in the early 1800s. So the Jackson supporters and the Adams supporters begin throwing insults back and forth about each candidate. Uh, the, ja the Jacksonians, for example, accuse John Quincy Adams of being a pimp. They say that when he was the American minister in St. Petersburg, Russia, he made a habit of procuring young American girls for the pleasure of the czar. Uh, the <laughs> Politics is fun, right? Uh, the Adams camp accused Jackson of being a murderer. They famously print this thing that was called the Coffin Handbill that showed six black coffins and had the names of six individuals that were killed on Andrew Jackson's orders. So you had the American people choosing between a pimp and a murderer. Uh, sometimes politics don't change that much, I guess. Um, in any case, what does Rachel Donaldson have to do with any of this? Adams' supporters find out that story, that she was once married to two men at the same time. And they begin to make that a campaign issue. They begin to, to spread the rumor that she was a fallen woman, that she was an adulteress, that she was a sinner. And how could we have this woman be the first lady of the United States? Now, Andrew Jackson hears these rumors, sees what's happening, and does all he can to protect his wife. Make sure she doesn't read the newspapers. Make sure she's not at the, any of these political gatherings where, you know, bad things might be said about her. And he is really successful at keeping the news from her. In fact, it isn't until after the election in 1828, when Jackson has won, uh, Adams only wins in New England in that election, Jackson wins the rest of the country, that he lets his guard down. He kind of isn't as careful. And sure enough, what happens? She comes across these rumors about her, these attacks on her character, and essentially dies of shame. Uh, almost before Andrew Jackson is sworn in as president in 1829, he is a widower. And he will forever be uh, embittered about the death of his beloved Rachel, and he will blame John Quincy Adams uh, and Adams' supporters until the, the end of his life for the loss of his wife. So when Jackson 
goes into the presidency, he is a widower, widower, he does not have a wife, he's essentially a single man. And that brings us to the other, one of the other big scandals during Jackson's administration, the so-called petticoat war. What is a petticoat? Yeah, it's the ruffles underneath your, your, big, uh, your big gowns. Um, the petticoat war centered on a woman named Peggy O'Neill. It's sometimes called the Peggy O'Neill Affair. Peggy O'Neill was a, um, an interesting individual. She was the daughter of a Washington, D.C. boarding house keeper. Her parents owned a boarding house. Now, in the early 19th century, Washington, D.C. was nothing like it is today. It was essentially a couple of government buildings in the middle of a swamp. So it's kind of like it is today, I guess. Um, <laughs> but it was, there was really nothing there. When congressmen, when um, members of government were in session in Washington, D.C., they lived in boarding houses, essentially kind of uh, informal dormitories. Um, and these boarding houses were the center of much of the social activity in Washington, D.C. You would live in the boarding house, you would eat in the boarding house restaurant, there were various bars and taverns around. That was pretty much Washington in the 1820s and 1830s. So Peggy O'Neill grows up in this Washington boarding house and she becomes a very charming and beautiful girl. She is witty, she is smart, she is able to, to carry on political conversations with all these congressmen and senators that are in her parents' boarding house. She, is, um, she becomes very, very popular among members of Congress, the people staying in these boarding, uh, that, that resided in her parents' boarding house. Uh, this is kind of a fictional representation of Peggy O'Neill over here. But um, she becomes very charming, very eloquent, very well-spoken, and by all accounts, one of the prettiest girls in Washington, D.C. Well, when Peggy is about 16, she falls in love with a sailor, and they get married. And her parents actually set them up in another boarding house, basically across the street from where they are. So now she's in these two boarding houses. Well, her husband, the sailor, what do sailors do? They go to sea. Sure enough, he goes off to sea, leaving his young, pretty, charming wife at home uh, to deal with all of these congressmen and these senators and these politicians in Washington, D.C. Um, soon, Peggy O'Neill is... is um, keeping company with some of these senators and congressmen. And soon rumors begin circulating that she is, has actually become the mistress of some of these congressmen. Well, sure enough, these rumors eventually reach her husband at sea. And what happens? Well, he mysteriously dies. <laughs> some say that he dies accidentally, he falls off the ship. But there was also the rumor that he was so distraught by his wife's infidelities that he jumped off the ship, that he committed suicide. Now, news comes back that um, Mr. Timberlake, so she was Peggy O'Neill Timberlake at this point, uh, has, uh, is dead, and she is now a widow, a young widow. Uh, so she goes into a period of mourning. Traditionally, in the 19th century, when your husband died, you went into a year of mourning. You wouldn't socialize, you certainly wouldn't be seen with other men during that time period. But what happens? Peggy Eaton uh, is soon keeping company. Uh, excuse me, Peggy O'Neill is soon keeping company with a senator named John Eaton. John Eaton is one of Andrew Jackson's close political supporters. So uh, Peggy O'Neill is stepping out with John Eaton, this older senator. Um, the tongues begin to wag in Washington, D.C. And by the end of the year of 1828, O'Neill and Eaton are married. Scandalously, mere months after she gets news that her husband has died, she is now married to one of those men that she was reportedly having a, an affair with. Well, uh, that's part of the situation. What makes the, a really presidential scandal is that Andrew Jackson appoints John Eaton, to be his Secretary of War. He appoints him to his cabinet. So now, John Eaton and his young, scandalous wife are part of the uh, administration. Now, Andrew Jackson himself doesn't have a wife. He doesn't care at this point. But all of the other cabinet members had wives. And the Vice President of the United States, anybody know who the Vice President was? Yeah, nobody knows those guys. It was John C. Calhoun. <laughs> 
<coughs> Calhoun's wife was very much shocked. Uh, this is Calhoun and his wife, Florida, was very much shocked by this, the, the fact that uh, John Eaton's wife, Peggy Eaton, was this scandalous fallen woman. And because she is now essentially the grand dame of Washington society, uh, everybody else was following her lead, she was refusing to socialize with the Eatons. She was shunning them because of this tainted reputation. Well, that begins to upset Andrew Jackson. He wants to be the one in charge of his cabinet. He wants to be able to tell his cabinet members who they can and cannot socialize with. Yet, all of the cabinet wives are telling their, their husbands, we can't, we can't socialize with the Eatons. We're not going to pay them a social visit. Even if they pay us a social visit, we will not reciprocate. We will not go visit them. This situation starts to become all-encompassing. It becomes the focus of Jackson's first year first couple of years in office. He is trying to get his cabinet members to do what he wants. His cabinet members are listening to their wives and refusing to socialize with the Eatons because of Peggy Eaton's tainted reputation. The problem with this is that it eventually brings government to a standstill. Nothing is happening in Washington, D.C. because Jackson is so focused on this Peggy Eaton scandal. Well, what are we going to do? How are we going to solve this? Eventually, um, one guy emerges with an idea. That is this guy. Anybody know who that is? You should. He was president of the United States. Martin Van Buren. Yeah, Martin Van Buren. <laughs> Martin Van Buren, uh, whose nickname was the Little Magician. He was a political wizard. He knew how to play the game. He knew how to pull the strings. Well, Martin Van Buren has an idea. He says, hey, President Jackson. Martin Van Buren was in the cabinet also. Van Buren didn't have a wife. He too was a widower. And he sees an opportunity. He says, I'm going to go visit the Eatons. I'm going to be friendly to Peggy Eaton. I'm going to do what the president wants. Why? Because that'll make me look good in the president's eyes. So he goes and becomes friends with the Eatons. That raises Van Buren's, uh, Van Buren's status in Jackson's estimation. Yet the government is still at a standstill. Jackson is becoming friendly with Van Buren, wants to figure out how to solve this standstill. Van Buren says, Andy, I got an idea. This, he probably doesn't call him Andy, but I have an idea. This is what we're going to do. You should have all of your cabinet members resign. Ask for all of their resignations. They're not doing what you want them to do, so essentially fire them. And to facilitate this, Van Buren goes, and I'll be the first one. I will sacrifice myself, and I will resign from your cabinet, and then you can ask everybody else to resign. So Van Buren resigns from the cabinet. Jackson asks everybody else to resign. All the rats are fleeing the, uh, the falling house here, and the Peggy Eaton affair comes to a dramatic end. Um, Jackson is now able to appoint a new cabinet that he completely ignores. He begins relying on his friends, the so-called informal kitchen cabinet, and uh, governing the United States as he sees fit. So the Peggy Eaton affair, which was a relatively minor, um, minor thing, becomes this giant scandal in 1830s Washington, D.C., because, partly because of the stubbornness of the president and partly because of the stubbornness of uh, the cabinet wives and the, the control they had over their husbands. So we jump forward from Andrew Jackson. You can spend a lot of time talking about things in Andrew Jackson's administration, but we're going to jump forward to uh, another president who um, had some scandals associated with him, James Buchanan. <laughs> who can tell me anything about James Buchanan? He was gay. Well, ah, that's the scandal. You just ruined my talk. <laughs> um, Buchanan is widely considered to be one of the worst presidents in the United States, uh, in American history. Uh, if there was a Mount Rushmore of bad presidents, he would be on it. Um, now, why is that? Yeah. After the Civil War. It was right before the Civil War. He did nothing to prevent that from happening. He allowed the country to begin falling apart on his watch. Um, he was ineffective as a president, was ineffective as a legislator, really doesn't do much. But the scandal surrounding him wasn't so much about how bad of a president he was, but his personal relationships. Buchanan is the only bachelor president we've ever had. 
was never married, uh, was once engaged, but that engagement, and when he was a younger man, but that engagement doesn't work out. So he's never married. He never gets married. But he does begin to form a close relationship with this guy, William Rufus King, um, who was a congressman uh, and very much involved in government in the United States. The two men were roommates in boarding houses in their political career. And soon, rumors begin to circulate around them that why was Buchanan single? Why was he still a bachelor? And why is he so close to this other guy? And in fact, soon enough, uh, Washington gossips begin referring to them as Mr. Nancy and Aunt Fancy. There was very much this belief that uh, James Buchanan was in a, an intimate, emotional relationship with another man. Doesn't derail his political career, because it was a Washington scandal. It was very much uh, in, the, in the inner sanctum of Washington, D.C., and didn't really become publicly known. Uh, but this scandal is another mark against um, Buchanan, I guess. Another, another thing that he couldn't control in his political career. So after Buchanan, Abraham Lincoln is elected president. Uh, Lincoln sees the nation through the Civil War. When Lincoln's assassinated, Andrew Johnson becomes president. Andrew Johnson, another terrible president. He'd be, he'd be right up on that uh, bad Mount Rushmore with Buchanan. And after Andrew Johnson, who's elected president? Grant. Grant. Ulysses S. Grant. Grant, of course, uh, becomes president largely based on his military reputation. He was the general who defeated Lee. Uh, during the Civil War. He took the surrender at Appomattox. He, he was this, this military icon. But uh, strangely, Grant was pretty much a failure in everything else he tried. Uh, he was a failure in business. He was a failure, well, as we'll see, he was a failure in politics. He gets elected to the highest office in the land. He becomes president, but uh, he messes that up pretty good. Um, he was good at war, and he was good at marriage. He marries his wife, Julia. They are devoted to each other throughout their lives. And in fact, who's buried in Grant's tomb? Grant and his wife. And his wife. Uh, overlooking the Hudson River and Upper Manhattan, that is where they are both entombed. Um, so Grant is elected president after the Civil War. He is the first guy elected president after the Civil War. Andrew Johnson, of course, becomes president because he was the vice president. Now, Grant himself was a man of uh, pretty good moral character. He was not known to be a cheat, not known to be a criminal of any sort. But he was, uh, in many ways, an indifferent administrator. And that indifference led to his administration being one of the most scandal-plagued in American history, certainly in the 19th century. Um, in, during Grant's administration, there were several scandals that emerged. The Gold Ring scandal of 1869 was an attempt by uh, members of the administration and some high-ranking financiers in the American economy to corner the gold market, to drive up the price of gold. It was a very convoluted scheme that involved uh, buying up all the gold that was around um, to raise the price of wheat so that farmers would plant more wheat and harvest more wheat and then ship more wheat to market on the railroads. The uh, financiers were heavily invested in the railroads and if the railroads are getting more business and the stock and the value of the railroads would go up and then the gold comes back in. The end result of the gold ring of 1869 was that it actually ends up crashing the economy uh, and you go into a, an economic downturn in 1869. In 1872, there's the customs house ring Again, people in the administration, people close to Grant, trying to defraud the American government, defraud the American people by uh, storing imported goods in private warehouses and charging the federal government exorbitant fees for that uh, as part of the customs uh, transactions going on. And then finally in 1875, there was the whiskey ring. Lots of rings. Uh, the whiskey ring was, again, an attempt to defraud the federal government and the American people by uh, skimming the excise tax off the top of uh, produced whiskey. 
the government taxed whiskey production, and this was a way of avoiding the taxes and kind of lining the, po the pockets of those who were involved in it. These were all big scandals, but they pale in comparison to the doozy scandal during um, Grant's administration. That is the Credit Mobilier scandal. What is Credit Mobilier? No idea. Exactly. Credit Mobilier was a uh, shadow company that was created during the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, in the 1860s, the federal government began spending enormous amounts of money to build a railroad connecting the eastern part of this country with California. Um, famously, they, the, the two lines eventually meet up in Promontory Point, Utah in 1869. Well, in order to do this, the federal government hired some companies to actually do the construction. The Central Pacific and the Union Pacific, they were building rail lines, one starting in the east and heading west, the other heading in the west and heading east. Uh, the plan was that they would meet somewhere in the middle. That was pretty much the plan. Um, well, the company, uh, Credit Mobilier, was created by managers of the Union Pacific Railroad. It was essentially the contracting company. Credit Mobilier was the, the entity that was charging the federal government for the construction. And then the money would flow through Credit Mobilier and pay for the construction by the Union Pacific. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, you have that extra layer up there, which means it's pretty easy to skim a little bit off the top, right? So what was happening? The Union Pacific was building miles and miles of track across the United States, and they were charging the federal government X number of dollars. That bill went through Credit Mobilier. Credit Mobilier would charge the federal government X plus something number of dollars. And what would happen to that extra money? It was going into the pockets of the investors in Credit Mobilier, who happened to be the managers of the Union Pacific Railroad. So they were kind of double dipping. Now, this was a very big scandal not only because you had millions of dollars just kind of disappearing, but also because Credit Mobilier, the investors, were bribing officials to make them look the other way. Judges, congressmen, senators, even the vice president of the United States was on the take during the Credit Mobilier scandal. Now, Grant was not involved in this. He was, nobody brought, dragged him into this. But pretty much everybody else intimately involved with the administration was part of the Credit Mobilier scandal. Um, the cartoons over here on the, the screen show, here's the Credit Mobilier pie. You can see everybody's trying to get a piece of it. And Uncle Sam's trying to guard it, but people are sneaking in and grabbing a piece of pie. And this was the aftermath of it. The, the uh, sick ward in the federal hospital with those whose reputations were uh, severely damaged by the Credit Mobilier scandal, including the guy in the coffin here, Skylar Colfax, Vice President of the United States. His political reputation was essentially dead. And here you can see the New York Sun, the headline, the king of fraud, uh, colossal bribery, congressmen who have uh, robbed the people, all of that sort of stuff. It was a giant scandal, the largest scandal in American history to that point. Now, was the Transcontinental Railroad built? Of course, it is finished. But the fact that there was so little actual oversight and that it was so easy to defraud the American people is what really um, elevated Credit Mobilier as one of the great scandals in American history. Now we'll jump forward again uh, about another decade and we'll talk about this guy, Grover Cleveland. Anybody know anything about Grover Cleveland? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, Grover Cleveland has the unique distinction of being the only man elected president twice to non-consecutive terms. He's president for four years, loses his re-election bid, and then is re-elected four years later. So he's president twice. This, of course, causes confusion in uh, numbering the presidents of the United States. Do we count Grover Cleveland once or do we count him twice? because it's one guy, but two different administrations, so historians have these debates, because that's what we do. In any case, uh, Grover Cleveland, what scandals could possibly attach to Grover Cleveland? Well, there was one in particular that becomes um, almost comical. It was the Ma Ma Where's My Pa scandal. <laughs> Ma Ma Where's My Pa. The central issue of this scandal 
was that um, Grover Cleveland had fathered a child out of wedlock. And when he is running for president in 1884, uh, his political opponents seize on this and try to make it an issue in the campaign. Uh, here you see the cartoon. That's Grover Cleveland looking distressed, uh, an anonymous woman and a baby saying, I want my pa. His opponents come up with the slogan, Ma, Ma, where's my pa, as a way of ridiculing Grover Cleveland over this issue. Now, for his part, uh, Grover Cleveland did sort of an honorable thing. He took care of the child. Uh, he was secretly paying the, the woman, Maria Halpin, who you see uh, her obituary over there on the right. He was sending her money so that the child could be taken care of, so that the child could have a, a decent life. But the political opponents see this as a, a sign of moral failing uh, in a candidate for the presidency. Yet, when the American people vote in 1884, Ma, ma, where's my pa? Isn't really an issue. And in fact, after Cleveland wins the election, his supporters come up with a retort. Ma, ma, where's my pa? Going to the White House. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> He's gone to the White House. Ha, ha, ha. He won the election despite <laughs> this scandal. Now, Grover Cleveland, we're not done with Grover Cleveland yet. There is another story around Grover Cleveland, which at the time wasn't really scandalous, but today is kind of a little bit icky, I guess is the best way to describe it. And that has to do with his marriage. Grover Cleveland gets married while he is president of the United States. And the woman he marries is Frances Folsom. Frances Folsom was a good deal younger than Grover Cleveland. That's not necessarily the scandal itself or the, the ickiness. The story with Frances Folsom is that her father was one of Grover Cleveland's best friends. And when the father dies, he puts his daughter's care in the hands of Grover Cleveland. He essentially raises Frances Folsom from the time that she was a child. When she turns 19, they get married in the White House. Grover Cleveland was in his 50s at this point. Um, how many of you remember Celine Dion and her husband? That was kind of the same situation, right? He was her manager from when she was a child, and when she grew up, they fell in love and got married. You have that same situation over here. Kind of icky to us today, kind of makes us shudder a little bit, but at the time, wasn't really that big a deal. And in fact, it's a White House wedding. You don't see those very often, so that was a big event. Um, for her part, Frances Folsom uh, was... No, Frances Folsom Cleveland now, was very popular in Washington, D.C. She was a wonderful hostess. People liked going to the White House. Uh, she was very gracious in, her, in her, uh, her hostess duties. She was fun to be around. She was actually a, a, uh, a good thing politically for Grover Cleveland. She was very much a, a, um, a helpmate in his political career. So we have these two stories with Grover Cleveland. A little bit icky, but nothing too dramatically scandalous. At least he's not robbing the uh, American treasury, right? <laughs> and that brings us to Warren G. Harding. <laughs> <laughs> um, Warren G. Harding is a, an interesting character. He was a politician from Ohio. Uh, wealthy man, successful businessman, um, who was probably not cut out to be president. Um, there's a story about Warren G. Harding that supposedly when he was growing up, his father said to him, Warren, it's a good thing you weren't born a girl because you can't say no to anybody. <laughs> now, um, that notion, that kind of tendency, uh, stayed with, uh, Harding into his adult life. And in fact, when he's elected president in 1920 and takes office in 1921, um, he brings many of his buddies with him into the administration. His poker buddies from, from Ohio, the guys he was smoking cigars with, some drinking buddies, um, which was especially dangerous because that's the middle of pro or the beginning of prohibition right here. Uh, you know, so he brought, brings his friends with him to the White House. And once his friends are in these offices, as secretaries of state and, and secretaries of whatever, members of the administration, what do they begin to do? but take advantage of the friendship of the president. 
Harding trusted the wrong people. Much like Grant before him, Grant trusted the people he appointed to office. Harding trusted the people he appointed to office, and those people begin to take advantage of that trust. Um, in, early in Harding's administration, a scandal breaks out that concerned the Veterans Bureau. The Veterans Bureau was formed in the wake of the First World War with the job of building veterans' hospitals across the country for the wounded soldiers who had fought in Europe um, from 1917 to 1918. Well, Harding puts one of his friends in charge of the veterans' hospitals, the Veterans Bureau. His job is to make sure these hospitals are built. So, I can't remember the man's name because it's not the main scandal I want to talk about, but uh, this head of the Veterans Bureau goes around, travels around the country inspecting the hospitals that are being built. Now, he has lots of friends in the construction business. And sure enough, who are the people that are getting the contracts to build these veterans' hospitals? But the friends. And when they are building the hospitals, it costs them $200 a bed to build a hospital. They're charging the federal government $300 a, head, uh, a bed. Where is that differential going? Pockets. Into pockets. So the Veterans Bureau scandal shows the defrauding of the American government through the building of these military hospitals. The big scandal during Harding's administration, however, had to do with oil. The Teapot Dome scandal. Now what was Teapot Dome? Teapot Dome itself is actually a geographic uh, location in Wyoming. It is a geological formation of this rock on top of a mound, and from a distance it kind of looks like a teapot sitting on top of a dome. Hence the name Teapot Dome. But the scandal at Teapot Dome involved oil. The area around Teapot Dome in Wyoming had vast natural oil reserves. There was oil underground. And those oil reserves had been set aside for the use of the Department of the Navy. At this time, Navy ships were, were oil burning. Um, so you have these vast naval reser oil reserves set aside for the use of the federal government, for the use of the American people. Well, when um, Harding becomes president, he appoints his buddy over there, Albert Fall, to be the Secretary of the Interior. And the Secretary of the Interior convinces the Secretary of the Navy to transfer control of those oil reserves from the Navy Department to the Interior Department. Secretary of the Navy says, fine, that makes sense. It's in the interior, why not? Well, what does Fall immediately do? But he begins leasing drilling rights on those oil reserves to his buddies in the oil industry. He gets uh, a bunch of no-bid contracts from these oil companies and allows them to begin uh, exploiting the oil resources at Teapot Dome. It was another place in California that was part of this scandal too. It was called Black Elk Hills, I believe. So these two oil reserves are now um, being used by private oil companies. Now, Fall was within his rights, his legal responsibilities of issuing these no-bid contracts. He could do that as Secretary of the Interior. What's the problem that emerges? Is that suddenly people notice that Albert Fall is spending lots of money. Lots of money that he can't possibly be making. He's buying land in the West. He's buying cattle for his ranches. He's wearing fancy clothes and driving fancy cars. Well beyond his means. So people start asking questions. The Attorney General begins asking questions. Congress begins asking questions. And sure enough, what do they find? But he had been taking kickbacks from the oil companies to whom he had given these no-bid contracts. He was making himself rich off of the... Um, exploitation of the property of the American people. Now, when Harding finds out about this scandal, he is irate. Uh, he is incredibly angry. He calls Fall to the White House. And when he enters the building, uh, supposedly, Harding grabs him by the lapels and is violently shaking him, uh, almost strangling him. Uh, Harding finally gains control of, his, of himself, manages to calm himself down somewhat, and basically uh, fires Fall on the spot. Um, he, Albert Fall, kind of says, okay, I'm out of here. He takes off and he disappears to Europe for a short while. Um, Harding is so angry that he decides he needs to get out of Washington, D.C. And he hops on a train to take a cross-country train ride to California. 
It's on this cross-country train ride in California that Harding has a massive heart attack and dies. So these scandals don't actually become public until after Harding's death. Fall, for his part, uh, comes back from Europe and is soon uh, arrested because of his, his scandalous behavior here, his taking of bribes. He ends up on trial and is eventually convicted and imprisoned. He is the first cabinet member in American history to ever go to jail. Kind of a dubious historical distinction. So Teapot Dome becomes the biggest political scandal in American history. You are defrauding the American people. You're endangering the security of the United States. Um, you have cabinet members imprisoned. That's tough to beat, isn't it? <laughs> Until we get to this guy. <laughs> Richard Nixon. Um, what can we say about Nixon? He, he said he wasn't a crook. Can't find anybody who voted for him. That's funny, huh? He won, wins election twice, but nobody voted for him. Uh, he had some, some victories during his presidency. He had some achievements, particularly in the, the realm of foreign affairs, uh, getting us out of Vietnam, opening China. Those types of uh, achievements were significant. The entire thing of detente with the, with the Russians, kind of ratcheting down some of the tensions of the Cold War. But why do we remember Richard Nixon? Watergate. Watergate. Well, there was checkers, but that was much earlier in his political <laughs> career. Uh, what was Watergate? What is Watergate? It's a, so it's a hotel, apartment, office complex. A very nice location along the Potomac River in Washington, D.C. Still one of the more um, exclusive addresses in Washington, D.C. But why? Uh, why do we have Nixon to think that every scandal after Watergate is something gate? <laughs> what happens in Watergate, at Watergate in 1972 but a third-rate burglary? The Democratic National Committee headquarters were located in the Watergate building complex, and this is Watergate over here. And uh, in 1972, Nixon is running for re-election and uh, really, really wanted to make sure that he won re-election. Now, whether Nixon was involved in the initial endeavor is up for debate, but there were certain people in his administration who wanted to ensure that Nixon was going to win. So they orchestrate this burglary into the, uh, the DNC headquarters to find dirt on Nixon's political opponents. Who was Nixon running against in 72? Does anybody remember? George McGovern. George McGovern, okay. Yeah, I couldn't remember either, so. <laughs> uh, McGovern, so he's digging for dirt. Basically, there are political operatives looking for opposition research, looking for dirt. The problem is the burglars were not, uh, not professional burglars and not good at what they were doing, and they are caught. Well, it could have ended there. It could have just been a couple of low-level buffoons breaking to the National Democratic Committee headquarters, and that was the end of it. But what happens? Uh, we get to the tapes. It wasn't the crime. It was the cover-up. When Nixon finds out about this, he begins to orchestrate a cover-up, trying to make sure that it doesn't get traced back to him, back to his administration, back to the White House. And sure enough, what happens? It, it gets traced back to the White House, to the administration, to Nixon himself. Um, here you see Nixon as Pinocchio with the nose growing longer. Uh, Nixon had a great face for the cartoonists. Uh, and here, I have discovered that according to a secret tape of June 23rd, 1972, I am a crook. Uh, <laughs> Of course, he famously goes on TV and says, the American people have the right to know whether or not their president is a crook. I am not a crook. Well, you are. Um, so this cover-up, it's the cover-up that sinks the administration. The fact that um, attorneys general and prosecutors are being fired by the administration. The fact that there is all sorts of obfuscation trying to, to hide the trail. Um, a couple of newspaper reporters in Washington, D.C. begin to investigate this, this break-in 
a little bit more intently. Uh, Woodward and Bernstein. And of course, they soon have a, uh, an inside source who is bringing them some information. A guy named Deep Throat. And they meet him in a park, darkened parking garage in Washington, D.C. And what is the advice that they're given? But follow the money. Always follow the money. And that money trail eventually leads all the way up to the Nixon White House. Um, Nixon, of course, was immensely paranoid in many ways. So he had tape recordings of everything that went on in the Oval Office. And sure enough, what do those tape recordings show? He knew about it and he was guilty of a cover-up. So, as the House of Representatives is finding out all this evidence, they are preparing articles of impeachment for Richard Nixon. They are going to put him on trial. But what does Nixon do? In order to prevent or avoid impeachment, he decides to resign. On August 9th, 1974, he resigns the presidency, very succinctly, uh, writing a letter to um, Kissinger, Henry Kissinger. I hereby resign the office of president of the United States, signs it, and that was done. Nixon resigns. Now, Nixon is succeeded by his vice president, Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford was Nixon's second vice president. Who was his first? Spiro Agnew. Spiro Agnew. What happened to Spiro Agnew? Real estate scandal in Maryland. He, went to jail. he was in jail. So Nixon picked a, a good vice president there. Uh, Agnew had been former governor of Maryland, gets involved in some real estate scandal, I think tax evasion too, and ends up uh, being forced to resign and ends up in jail. Ford, interestingly, is the only man to become president who was never elected to the presidency or the vice presidency. Nobody ever voted for him to be in that position, yet he becomes president in 1974. That, um, when Ford becomes president, he has a tremendous amount of popularity. Ford was a career uh, member of the House of Representatives, very upright, free of scandals. Um, Nixon, of course, famously gets on the Marine helicopter and gives his victory salute as he is leaving uh, the White House, no longer a president, but a disgraced former president. And uh, Ford has political goodwill, but what does Ford do? He pardons Richard Nixon. And that, in many ways, um, undermines Ford's presidency. In 1976, he, fierce political campaign, Ford is defeated by Jimmy Carter. Interestingly, Jimmy Carter is the first president from the Deep South since the Civil War. So he's the first Southern president. But there is another Southern president. That guy. Um, William Jefferson Clinton is elected president in 1992. He had been the governor of Arkansas and um, was kind of a dark horse candidate in 1992. Nobody knew this guy. Nobody figured that he would win. Um, but what do we find out about Clinton? Is that he was a masterful campaigner. He was very, very good at interpersonal relations, talking to, talking to the voters and kind of, you know, shaking hands and feeling their pain, if you remember, remember that. And surprisingly, to many people, becomes the Democratic nominee and surprisingly defeats the incumbent president, George H.W. Bush. Um, of course, the Bush presidency was undermined by the recession at that time. The economy was not good in 1992. So Clinton is elected president in 1992. Now, on the campaign trail, you start to hear some stories about Bill Clinton, right? Jennifer Flowers, Paula Jones. There are some uh, questionable moral activities in his background. But as we've seen in the past, the American people can sometimes overlook those questionable moral activities. But what happens during Clinton's presidency that really becomes one of the great modern political scandals? Monica Lewinsky. Uh, who was Monica Lewinsky? She, she was an intern in the White House. Um, and by happenstance and coincidence, ends up getting into a physical relationship with the President of the United States. Um, now in 
previous days, uh, presidents had lots of intimate relations with people that were not their wives. Um, LBJ, JFK, FDR, all the guys with the initials. Everybody had mistresses. <laughs> And it was a, a dirty secret in Washington, D.C., but it was something that the press largely ignored. What the president does on the president's time, we don't care about. Well, what was different here? Why does the Monica Lewinsky scandal become public? She has a friend who's not loyal to her, and there's a special prosecutor. Now, why was there a special prosecutor? Investigating a real estate deal. Investigating Whitewater. Whitewater was a questionable real estate deal that the Clintons had been involved in in Arkansas. It was a plan to develop a, a parcel of land along a river um, that they invest heavily in, make tremendous amounts of money, but the deal itself fails. Um, now, in the 1990s, American politics were bitterly divided. Um, you had a Democratic president and you had Republicans in charge of Congress. And there were questions about Clinton's um, activities, his morals, his, you know, what is his involvement with this real estate deal. So a special prosecutor is appointed, a guy named Ken Starr. Ken Starr begins investigating the Clintons, begins delving into all of their activities, going through files and talking to people. And Ken Starr um, gets, here's a story from a woman named Linda Tripp about the president having this affair with Monica Lewinsky. Linda Tripp, of course, is a friend of Monica Lewinsky's, uh, who Monica is telling all of these things, you know, the president and I, the blue dress, the cigars, that sort of stuff. We don't need to go into the details. But um, this information ends up on Ken Starr's desk. And during a deposition of the president, he asks about this affair, and the president denies it under oath. Uh, and that kind of sparks the entire issue with the Clinton-Monica Lewinsky scandal. Um, in many ways, you have to feel bad for Monica Lewinsky because she was 20-something years old and thrown into this, this whirlwind of political press and venom, and, and her life must have been chaotic as a result of this. But what was the end result of the Monica Lewinsky affair? was that Bill Clinton was impeached. He was only the second president in American history to be impeached. Who was the first? Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson in the wake of the Civil War. Again, the bad Mount Rushmore. Um, Bill Clinton is impeached essentially for lying to the special prosecutor, lying under oath, trying to obstruct justice. Now, what does it mean to be impeached? Set to a Senate trial. Impeachment is essentially <laughs> akin to being accused of a crime in a, a criminal proceeding. It's like a grand jury saying that there is enough evidence to proceed to a trial. So the House of Representatives issues these articles of impeachment saying there's evidence that the president did something wrong. So four articles of impeachment are drawn up by the House of Representatives. I think only two of them are actually sent to the Senate. And the Senate becomes the, the body where the trial is held. The Chief Justice of the United States, at that time William Rehnquist, presides over the trial. This is Rehnquist here, he had his fancy robe with the, uh, the, the gold stripes on the sleeves. Uh, presides over the trial, and you basically have the Senate deciding the fate of the president. Well, what happens? In the case of Clinton, he is acquitted. He gets to remain president. He is not kicked out of office. Same thing happened to Andrew Johnson in 1867. 66, 67. He gets to stay president, but it is incredibly uh, politically damaging uh, to a reputation to be impeached. Um, so the impeachment of Bill Clinton is really the last major scandal that uh, we talk about, or I talk about in this talk. But it does bring up kind of a a cartoon from earlier uh, this century, I lied that we weren't going into the 21st century. Um, here you have Nixon, I obstructed justice, and Clinton, I had sex with the White House intern. And if you recall, about 2012 or so, there was a scandal with the IRS that uh, some paperwork hadn't been filed properly and people were looking at papers and investigating others. That's what this, 
that was what scandals were like at that point. Um, we might have to revisit this talk in a few years, of course. Uh, there's lots of material that could perhaps make its way into it. So does anybody have any questions, comments? Remember some scandals that you think should be in here that aren't. All right, well, I hope you found that enjoyable, and uh, thanks for coming out.